All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are here with Samantha and Wade, and they are going to be presenting on drive control selection following acquired brain injury. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Sam Williams. I'm an occupational therapist at a um, neuro rehab facility called On With Life in Ankeny, Iowa. Um, and I'm currently the our spinal cord injury and dura durable medical equipment program coordinator for both of those programs. All right, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wade Lucas. Um, I'm the clinic one of the clinical educators uh, for quantum rehab. So uh, my background is as a physical therapist working in a wide variety of ind industry related fields. So working as a clinician, doing the evaluations, working as a DME supplier, and now working for uh, the manufacturer side. So um, that is my disclosure. I do represent quantum rehab and stealth products. And so thanks for letting us be here today and joining us for this, uh, this session. We're really excited about this session because uh, Sam and I had an opportunity to work. Uh, this is what we really wanted to do as a really case study based course, um, but also incorporate not only a patient population that may be a little bit underserved or you know, not necessarily considered for power mobility, uh, but also look into a couple case studies and how we got through that clinical decision-making process and how we ended up where we did with those individuals and had success with the drive controls and looking at it from a case study um, perspective. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today. So I'm going to turn it over to Sam to get us started. I, I'll try to split my time, but I need to stand close to the slides because I don't have them in front of me. But um, So just our objectives for the day, that you'll be able to distinguish the variable clinical presentations of acquired brain injuries and how they affect mobility device selection, um, apply the hierarchy of drive control for potential drive options when evaluating, evaluating an individual affected by a brain injury, and distinguish at least two key training principles in the literature to implement when working on power mobility with an individual affected by a brain injury. So I assume most of us in the room have worked with person served with brain injuries before. Um, and you might hear me say person served a lot. That's the language we use at my rehab facility instead of patient or client. We just have adopted the language of person served. So that's what I'm talking about when I say that. But a, a, an acquired brain injury is any brain injury that's happened, traumatic or non-traumatic, um, after birth. Um, so traumatic injuries happen, falls, assaults, car accidents, sports injuries, violence, gunshot wounds. Um, and non-traumatic injuries are things like strokes, infectious diseases, seizures, tumors, anoxia, or lack of oxygen. Um, and actually, both of our case studies today are due to anoxia and loss of oxygen, aneurysms, and other metabolic disorders. So I like to say, well, when you've seen one, one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. Um, they're all very different. They can range from mild, moderate, to severe, um, but all of them kind of can have a range of medical complications, physically, cognitive, or language that are going to impact their mobility. Um, and those things can be functional, um, like hemiparesis and hemiplegia, speech and swallowing, memory and attention, or physiological, like changes in their respiratory, altered sensation, um, edema, circulatory issues and things like that, all things that we have to consider when working with somebody with a brain injury and choosing mobility device. And in my experience, most of these complications require long-term medical follow-up. Um, actually, in the um, case study that I'll talk about, um, his mobility needs changed as he progressed. He got a baclofen pump. Um, which increased, he kind of was able to loosen up and then was able to open up, open up some other drive control options for him. I've also needed to change um, mobility options down the road post Botox, um, post tendon releases. Um, and I've also had, you know, to change things on if their OGCOM device changes. So if they start off using eye gaze, 
maybe the mount is up here, they're able to progress and um, you know, use a communication device with direct select, that mounting placement might need to be different. I've also seen changes with vision um, improvements and like uh, sometimes they've had a surgery to surgically correct their vision and they're able to now be safer with a different type of mobility option. So just something to consider with that as well. So all of these complications can lead to difficulties with mobility. Um, whether the person served as walking with or without an assisted device, if they're using um, a manual wheelchair mobility and what we're gonna talk about today is how all of these affect power mobility. And just because somebody might have one or more of the things on this slide doesn't mean that they're not a candidate for power mobility. I mean, as a therapist and working in an inpatient rehab facility that is really focused on safety and um, you know, reducing injuries and all of that, you know, somebody with impulsivity or difficulty sequencing might trigger a red flag for me where I won't consider power mobility for them. But that's really not the case because there's so many different options out there that um, can help medi mediate those issues. So this is a research study that um, looked over 17 different other studies that looked at the relationship between cognition and power mobility. And just to focus on the the quote at the bottom of the slide there that says cognitive functioning alone should not be the deciding factor for power mobility provision and it is not sufficient to capture the complex interactions between the person, the environment, and the occupation through mobility use. Um, I think that's that was just kind of a, an aha moment for me to look at that and as somebody that works in brain injury almost exclusively, um, just a reminder to always, you know, not, not exclude it right away. Um, they also, this, this study um, was the same study, but the quote here, um, while the mode of transportation may change, the importance remains constant. Transportation from one location to another is critical to engagement and meaningful activity. So we want them to be able to get to, from one place to the other independently and safely. And what can we do to help them with that? I'll go ahead and uh, take over for now. So. Now that Sam's talked about and kind of given a, a, a review of some of the conditions that we have to factor into with brain injuries or acquired brain injuries, I wanna take a look at kind of the wheelchair side of it and the power mobility considerations first. And then with the case studies, kind of draw it all together and how we progress through that clinical decision-making process. So one of the things I wanted to talk about first is, is training considerations. And if you think about it as we're dealing with individuals with like Sam said, a wide variety of different cognitive levels. And, and not only are we battling, you know, oftentimes very significant physical challenges, oftentimes those physical challenges or those physical impairments make it difficult for us to get a really good understanding of what their level of cognitive function is. And oftentimes, and as you'll see in both of the case studies that we talk about today, that was the factor. And it was um, power mobility initially was a little bit delayed, or at least us approaching that power mobility because of their uh, very severe physical presentations. It actually oftentimes, you know, comes from that entire team aspect, having your PT, your OT, and your speech collaborating. And, and I think in both cases, the, it was kind of the speech therapist that said, hey, this is what I've noticed. How can we, you know, can we potentially relate that over you know, whether it was they were becoming more effective and more accurate with an AAC device, or they were accurate with switch hits or activating, you know, like their iPad or using something like that. So that can actually give us some insight on drive control selection and, and, and some insight on their ability to um, handle and manage a power wheelchair um, effectively. So just a couple of things that I think of when and I've used this working with traumatic brain injuries. I've used kind of some of these topics working with, with pediatrics um, as well. But oftentimes we're, it's beneficial to start and really limit the amount of distractions 
that are occurring when you're at least when you're starting. Obviously, we want to progress them eventually where they can be in more of a community type, you know, community type independence. But oftentimes we have to back up and we have to take it slow and it has to be quiet and and quiet and very familiar environments. We also want to make sure that we give them the opportunity to kind of explore the devices, you know, and whether you're using like even like a simple switch, like allowing them to say, hey, I, I realize when I hit this switch or I do this movement, the chair is going to move. And whether that's starting off with very simple processes, like just maybe adding forward alone. There are drive control systems and central processing units that interface the drive controls with the power wheelchair that allow us to really maybe back up a little bit and make things a little simpler. For example, all right, um, I've had some individuals where we started as simple as there's a button on a tray in front of them and when they hit that button, they go forward. And we just start with forward until they get that idea of stop and go. And then we can add that directional components and then factoring how am I gonna go in reverse and going into reverse and that sort of thing. So keeping it simple and then progressing over time. They don't have to be independent and just jump right into a specific drive control. All of us, all, this is always just a good reminder. Every time when I talk about drive controls, it's really important that we, as, as clinicians and evaluating clinicians and ATP suppliers, it's about seating first. Because if we don't have that ideal optimal position for the individual, because what we want to do is make sure that we're providing that proximal stability in order to promote that distal function. And if we can provide that by providing that distant, distal function, we can be able to assess and identify reproducible and consistent movements, which is what's going to be important for drive control selection. So we can't do that with, without proper seating, because if a person is in their wheelchair one way one day, they may be able to have these effective movements, but changing their position even just a little bit can affect access to that device. We also want to make sure as they're progressing through the day and carrying out their daily routine that we know that we run into terrain, right? We shift, we move, hopefully they're doing their pressure relief. Hopefully they're tilting and reclining. Sometimes we can get shifted out of position a little bit. So we wanna do everything we can from a seating perspective to make sure oftentimes we're looking at very, the need for very consistent positioning and consistent access, all right? So once we've identified some of those consistent and reproducible movements, then we can start thinking about some of the drive controls. But we also have to think about what is their strength and endurance with those reproducible movements as well. Is it, yes, they can do that movement once or twice or maybe throughout the morning, but after they've done it a hundred times in a day, or do they become fatigued and we have to change and we have to consider something else? Do we have to consider multiple different drive options, one that maybe they can use in the morning that's more efficient and more intuitive, but by the afternoon, maybe it's, it's something different. Then as it pertains to the actual devices, it's important to, you know, not everybody, uh, you know, that's why it's a really important team aspect between the client, the, the clinician and the supplier, because not one team member can know everything, right? So, you know, clinicians are specifically trained in you know, in the human body and the physiological processes and the biomechanics. And then we have to rely sometimes on our, our DME suppliers that are that, those equipment experts. But we have to take into account what the physical specifications of that device are, right? How much effort or how much strength does it take to activate a switch? How much movement does it need? Where can it be mounted? What are our, you know, ability to bring that device, it might be the best device for that person, but if we can't get it to the location that they need it to be to operate it on a consistent basis, it's no good. So we have to understand physical specifications, mounting options. And I think, in my opinion, one of the things that we don't always factor in are what are the programming capabilities? I'm a big advocate for thinking about the programming and understanding the programming capabilities of the device. Because as you'll see in the case studies, 
choosing the right device wasn't enough. Yes, it was a great start, but we needed some very specific programming to optimize driving and optimize the overall independence. Okay. We also need to consider the other technologies that that person could benefit from. We're, we're really in an awesome time period where we have lots of advancing technology with all of the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth technologies where it's really made things more cost-effective actually because Bluetooth technology is built into expandable controllers and expandable electronics. So it's really a great time to be able to give our end users and our patients maximum amount of access to not only mobility, but to all of these other great technologies, home environmental controls, um, speech generating devices and things like that. But why I really put this in here is I've had a number of individuals that what was working okay for their drive control was working well for their drive control didn't necessarily work well for them controlling their AAC device. So what other device could we consider that gave, continued to keep them mobile and independent with their mobility, but also gave them better access to their environment? For example, I had worked with an individual that was mid forties, severe spastic tetraplegia, cerebral palsy, and he could manage the wheelchair with a standard joystick. But when he tried to use that joystick as a mouse emulator and use it on a cursor to stop in a very specific area on his AAC device, he had trouble, he had gross motor, but he didn't have the fine motor to stop it. So we actually put a heavier duty joystick on where it gave, it required more force to move it. But what it did was when he started taking his pressure off of it, he was able to stop quicker. So he was able to stop that device on the AAC, the pointer more accurately and more consistently. So just think about those other things that they have to do throughout their day. And then really before we dive into the drive control selection, we have to remember some of the other important components, just, as, just like with the other technologies as far as like environmental controls and AAC, we have to make sure that the drive control device is gonna give them access to power positioning because these the individuals that we're working with need a means to change their pressure, change their position to relieve pressure, change their position for different functional activities. We need to think about drive wheel configuration, whether it's front wheel drive, mid wheel drive, rear wheel drive, whatever gives them the best access and the best, um, you know, I worked in a large inpatient rehab facility and we did a lot of head array devices. And oftentimes it would surprise me when I would, when we would look at and trial different dry wheel configurations of what individuals ended up choosing. I had a number of head array uh, users prefer front wheel drive just because it felt more natural to them and there was less of the chair out in front of them. So consider some of the dry wheel consideration factors. Um, you know, just don't assume that the best dry wheel configuration maybe is mid wheel because that's kind of the popular configuration now, right? And it's great, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but at least, you know, consider the pros and cons. Making sure that we're looking at the suspension in the product, all of our complex chairs or our group three and group four chairs are required to have suspension. And that suspension is key because at, we're hoping to make them as active as possible and not just be on flat, solid surfaces all the time. We wanna get them the person out and moving around and through the community where there could be rougher terrain. And without that suspension, it could jostle them and put them into, <clears throat> into positions where they can no longer access their device. And then especially when we start looking at switch control devices, thinking about and considering tracking technologies just to make that driving safer, more efficient, less, you know, the, the requirement of less commands to maintain a straight path and looking into those tracking technologies and um, thinking about that as well. I know that's a, a sore subject. We, I just went through uh, helping someone back home, a cl clinician and uh, a family with drive controls. We were trying to get tracking technology for him and appeal after appeal. And finally, it was going to a state fair hearing and they finally overturned it the day before. So sometimes it's a lot of work and we got to keep pushing for it. But if it's important, um, we got to keep we got to keep fighting, just like you said this morning. We, who, if we're not going to fight for our patients, who is? Right. So, so when we start thinking about drive controls, there's really two different types. There's proportional devices and there's switch devices. 
So when we look at proportional devices, I think most everybody is pretty familiar with what a proportional device is. Probably everybody got to Pittsburgh by some form of uh, proportional device, whether it was a gas pedal, or the, the, you know, the plane throttle, but basically meaning the more input that you give, the more output you're going to get. That's essentially what a proportional device is. Also what proportional devices, especially proportional joysticks, is it gives us 360 degrees of control. So not only do we have forward, left, right, reverse, we have the diagonals, but we have all of those angles in between. So what that allows us to do is make, as we're starting to move down a pathway, and if our course starts to veer or go off course, it's very slight, very, like most of us wouldn't even realize that we're doing it. We're just naturally kind of like our steering wheel. We don't often realize there's a curve in the road, right? We don't, we just naturally make those subtle adjustments. Well, the same thing with our proportional controls and those proportional controls with that makes it more efficient and it tends to be more intuitive for the individual. So the kind of the idea is, and as we look at this drive control selection process or what we term as the hierarchy of drive controls is that our, what we wanna do is consider all of our options for proportional devices first before moving on to switches. And because that gives that person um, potentially more control, more intuitive control, more efficiency and that sort of thing. A couple of things to remember is that it does require a certain level of motor control, especially fine motor control. We have to be able, that proportionality requires us to have graded movements in order to control that speed to be able to do just a little bit of input when we need just a little bit of input versus you know, a gross motor movement is I'm gonna push it forward, but I have no control. I'm either pushing it all the way or it's nothing, it's, okay? We also need to think about um, proportional controls for individuals that have not had that previous proportional experience. It might not be the most intuitive. So children that have not you know, had that previous mobility experience, or individuals that kind of some will some, at times fit into the acquired brain injury status of those cognitive impairments. Maybe it's not the most intuitive device for them. If we've considered all the proportional options and we basically ruled those out, then we start looking at switches. So the switches are an all or nothing response. So, so it's like the light switch, it's either on or it's off. So we lose that kind of that 360 degrees of control. We basically have a switch assigned to each direction. So that's why, you know, important to, especially with switch devices that we're assessing those consistent reproducible movements. We can go in diagonal directions if we're able, if the person's able to access two switches at the same time, depending on the setup. But like our speed changes usually require um, either some sort of stepped of programming, whether you start in a latch where you're going slow and then it, each, each additional input, you go a little bit faster or by changing modes. So there's some programming that goes into it to make that chair more efficient to allow them to change their speed, but it's additional inputs. So they have to maybe hit another switch or do a double command in order to change modes. Okay, so we have to consider that. And then again, it might be an option for someone with less motor control and then also individuals with impaired cognitive function or maybe like children with that do not have that previous mobility experience. So when we think about it, you know, all of us are probably pretty familiar and we'll probably get things thrown at me for bringing up this term, but our mobility algorithm, everybody just loves that term, right? That we have to follow that less expensive, through, you know, when we're deciding on mobility basis. But when we look at that algorithm, what we're really doing also, it, it's not a just the yes or no, can the person walk or not? It's not only can they walk, but should they be walking? So maybe that, that gate device, they can do it, but for whatever reason may not be the best, maybe it's not functional from a, you know, an endurance or a stamina aspect, or maybe they're not safe, or maybe they're not timely, but mobility needs to be efficient. And it's not just that yes or no, can they do it or not? So the th same thing with our drive controls. So we need to think about what, because oftentimes, especially if we're working with individuals with progressive conditions, 
there's a fatigue factor that goes into it. And if when we're looking at those different drive codes, if it wears that person out, is there something else that's more efficient or less um, energy expenditure for that individual? Okay. So we want to look at proportional controls first, consider them. If we've ruled that out, then we move to the digital or switch controls. So I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time going into the specifics of this because we're going to look at it kind of step by step when we look at the case studies. But if you look within those proportional controls, kind of the hierarchy or what I like to call it kind of the decision-making process or considerations that, or maybe even the drive control algorithm, if you want to call it that. But what we start with is kind of that standard inline joystick. All right, that's the joystick that kind of comes with the power mobility device, or it's kind of that expected standard device. We consider that and we either rule it out or we recommend it. If that standard inline joystick isn't an option, then we see what sort of modifications we can make to it. And there's really kind of three categories to modifications for those that standard joystick. One would be changing the handle or the top shape. All of the power wheelchair manufacturers, you can you can basically remove that top that standard shaped handle, and you can put on different shapes. Whether it's like a goal post, whether it's kind of a ball shaped, and you'll see some different. Uh, what we chose for the first case study um, was well, it was actually a picture of it on there, but wide variety of different shapes, sizes, and colors. We can change the mounting so we can move where that device is positioned for that individual. And then again, my favorite part of it is the programming. So there are specific programming features that, hey, maybe they're not able to utilize that standard joystick, but if we make these programming changes, they can. And we'll talk about those here in just a second. Once we've kind of exhausted all of our options for the standard joystick, we can look at some alternative joysticks. And then of course, all the different uh, alternative joysticks with different types of mounting options and things like that. And programming. Programming again is at all of these, all of these steps. And then, then there's other alternative device options out on the market as well. So just real quick, what are options for to promote and maintain the use of proportional controls? I mentioned the joystick shape options the mounting options, and then programming options, and then our alternative proportional controls. So if we look at some of those options, and again, I'm not gonna go into just for the sake of time, uh, we have a number of courses on our learning management system that takes kind of a deeper dive into some of these programming features. Uh, but here's some of these for just your, your standard joystick, and not only your standard joystick, but also these programming changes can be made with uh, the alternative joysticks as well. So changing and programming the joystick throw or basically the distance that the person has to push the joystick for it to, to uh, take an, a full command. Center dead band and tremor suppression or dampening a couple options if that person has impaired motor control or has tremors, uh, we can do some of those adjustments. We can reassign directions. We're gonna talk more specifically about that here in a minute. But basically if that, when we look at those consistent reproducible movements, we want to assign the most consistent and the most reproducible movement to what direction? Forward, because that's the direction hopefully we're going most of the time, right? So sometimes forward is not the person's strongest movement. I worked working in a facility where we have a, um, a high census of spinal cord injury individuals, where sometimes pushing forward is not the strongest. I've even worked with some um, progressive conditions, ALS, um, and some advanced MS type individuals where pulling backward on the joystick was the strongest movement. So we can reassign and change the direction without having to remount the joystick in the configuration, we can change it within the programming. We can also make it a three direction joystick. So maybe that individual cannot push one of the directions at all. So I've had spinal cord injury um, individuals where they couldn't push forward at all. 
So what we did was we just took forward out and we had left, right, pulling backwards, went forward. And then we used a toggle command, which was a quick tap in the forward direction to change to reverse when they needed to go reverse. So three direction is an option. And then we can also like maybe that person has the strength and gross motor control to move in all four directions of the joystick, but they have difficulty with that graded movement. So we can actually turn that joystick into a switch joystick where it's kind of that all or nothing response. So once the joystick is deflected about 50% of the throw, it activates like the pressing a button or activating a switch. So th those are just some of the programming features to be kind of aware of that's an option, yeah. You can still go diagonal a little bit because it will recognize um, the, like basically like activating two commands at once. So like if you had two switches and you pushed forward and right at the same time, it would go kind of diagonal. That's kind of the same way with that switched input joystick. Um, but it's really gonna, it, what it really does is it takes that proportionality out of it where if they have a hard time controlling the speed, you know, they're trying to go slow, but they only have the gross motor movement and it takes them, you know, faster. Then when we move on to um, digital or switch devices, we're looking at the hierarchy of switch controls. And here we're looking at kind of how many consistent reproducible movements does the person have? We're looking at options for three to five switches, which one of our more common three to five switch devices is a head array. Um, and everybody familiar with what, head array setup is, so head controls with proximity switches most of the time. Um, but again, looking into those three to five switch inputs, then we work our way to pneumatic or sip and puff, and then maybe even combination systems. Combination systems can be, be great, especially one of the more common ones is that sip and puff and uh, head array combo really works nicely in some situations. Then we have two switch input options. Even if that person has one consistent reproducible movement, we can get them, not to spoil it, but we'll take a deeper look into one switch scan, but we can use scanning where essentially the arrows on the screen rotate around. And when that person, uh, when it highlights the direction that person wants to go, they activate their switch, okay? And then down at the bottom is uh, kind of a new advancing, exciting technology with, with eye gaze. So we've talked a lot about case studies. So let's jump into the first one. And uh, our first case study is uh, Brandon. And he was, uh, is a 20, well, when we did the case study, he was 24 years old with a pretty unremarkable medical history, pretty healthy, independent uh, individual working, suffered cardiac arrest and anoxic brain injury from a choking incident. And when he admitted to the, initially into the rehab hospital, very severe uh, physical limitations uh, to the point where it was very difficult to even assess his cognition at that time. So he had a very minimal amount of uh, range of motion in all of his extremities, dependent postural control, max to dependent for transfers, unable to ambulate, and then he was not able to verbalize or really communicate um, really much at all. It was, like I mentioned, it was difficult to assess his cognition just basically due to his um, very severe physical limitations and impairments. And then his initial mobility, uh, he was in a manual tilt and space for kind of that gravity assisted positioning and maximal amount of uh, postural support from headrest, lateral supports, positioning and skin protection cushion. With some intensive rehab, speech, PT, OT, he was able to make some very significant improvements, which was great. So he in increased the movement in his upper extremity more so on the right than on the left. He, he still had, uh, he started to, his unsupporting sitting got to um, improve quite a bit to where he could sit up on the edge of the mat with, with just a little bit of assistance. It wasn't always in the best in the best posture, but he was able to control his, his trunk a little bit more. He improved his ability to follow some commands and um, noted some increased movements, again, 
our good friends, the speech therapists, were working on him with switch access to activate because um, he was uh, basically using a um, just a low technology four quad or four quadrant board to communicate, um, but then was able to start using more advanced or more high tech technology with a simple switch. So even though he started showing some significant improvement overall with that intensive rehab and medical management, he was still unable to stand or ambulate. He had very severe contractures and lack of range of motion and motor control in his upper extremities. And you can see um, pretty significant flexion contractures kind of throughout, um, even a little bit in his, in his uh, core and in his um, kind of forward flex that you saw in the first one, still a little bit forward flex, a little bit forward head. He had um, limited uh, bilateral shoulder flexion, abduction and external rotation. He did have it, like I mentioned, a partially reducible thoracic kyphosis and then that forward flex cervical spine um, with, with some active movement, but again, not enough to really hold himself in a, what we would deem a more uh, ideal position. So as we, as we started looking at him and we started to see that his cognition was improving and some ability to follow commands and, and a increased ability to communicate with us, we realized, hey, he might be a candidate for power mobility. Um, manual mobility and gait was not gonna be an option for him. So we started to look at some different drive control options and we used the hierarchy of drive controls in our kind of our clinical decision-making process. So of course we said we were gonna start with that standard joystick. Well, it's pretty easy to see why we eliminated that from consideration right away. If we tried to basically do to his significant flexion contractures and lack of active range of motion, there was no way that we were getting him to be able to access that joystick kind of in that midline position, his flexion contractures, uh, his adduction contractures of his shoulder and internal rotation were really bringing him in more midline. When we looked at some modifications, we attempted to bring that joystick inside in more midline to him using um, kind of uh, a midline flip away type mount. Started to have a little bit more success with that and but he wasn't able to consistently grasp that standard handle so we removed the handle we tried a couple of the different handles and realized that he was able to he did not have the ability to really open and close his hands he wasn't able to take his hand out of the severe flexion as not only finger flexion wrist flexion so what we found was that we took that uh, basically it's like a six inch rod type device and he was actually able to start moving the joystick with that placed in between his knuckles, okay? However, with that standard joystick, we know that standard joystick's got a lot of buttons and different dials and speed potentiometers on it, and it's very big and bulky. So that wasn't an ideal joystick to really put midline especially since he couldn't access any of those buttons or any of those toggles or anything um, on, the, on the joystick anyway. So, and then I mentioned we weren't able to use that standard um, joystick knob. So we went to that standard kind of six inch uh, thinner rod uh, for him to try. And then, so then I kind of got ahead of myself. So we basically, if you look at this joystick, it's got all those buttons, the dials and the toggles that he wasn't able to access anyway. So there was no reason really, there was no benefit to have that big bulky joystick kind of in midline for him. So what we found was we tried a couple different alternative joystick types. And again, when you guys are down in the hall, check out some of the different booths that have different types of joysticks and different um, alternative drive controls and kind of check them out. I know there's booths down there that with examples of all these joysticks um, down there that you can look at. But what we eventually found was we ended up utilizing that on the right there was that mushroom type joystick because we could actually take the mushroom part off and put that six inch uh, thin rod on that joystick 
And what that joystick, other two benefits of that joystick were is that the way that that is built, it actually has less force requirement for that person to, to activate it, but it also has kind of a built-in tray here, which was important for, for the next slide, you know, because we mentioned some of the different programming features that we, that we needed to do for him, okay? So we attached that mushroom type joystick, removed the mushroom, put the different joystick handle on. And then what we realized was due to his contractures and his movement, and you'll see here in the video that I have to show of Brandon, is he could access reverse, but it was a lot of effort and a lot of work. He basically had to really lean, kind of lean forward and try to reach his arm around and try to hook around the device in order to go forward or to go reverse. So what we were able to do is a three direction joystick set up for him. So all he had to do was push forward to go forward left and right. And he could control that really easily with um, between his knuckles. What we had to think about though is when the times where he did have to go in reverse, how are we gonna give him reverse? What we do is a, we give him access to a toggle. And when you see the toggle and power wheelchair drive controls, that means basically flip a three direction setup where you're flipping it back and forth between forward and reverse. So the screen will look like this. You know, different manufacturers may look a little bit different, but essentially you have an arrow that shows when it's in forward and an arrow that shows when it's in reverse and a forward command in his case would go forward or reverse. So there's two different ways we could toggle. One would be a quick forward command or kind of a tapping of the forward command, just like we would do in a head array system. Or we have a separate switch that he could hit and it would toggle for him. And you'll see what we ended up choosing here in just a second. What we also noticed with him, and you'll see it in the video, is he was constantly initially kind of veering to the right. Well, what we, all right. No, he was veering to the left, I'm sorry. What we noticed is that his forward was not directly forward. So we had to go in and reassign the directions and we can go into the programming and it can basically detect what that person's movement are. So what his forward was, was slightly at a diagonal. So maybe at kind of a 20 or 30 degree diagonal. So he was actually kind of pushing forward and left to go forward. So we were able to reassign those directions um, for him as well. And then we weren't done yet. So what I really want you guys to understand is it's not always just, yes, choosing the correct device is important, but what's also important is understanding what we can do with it. Because just setting up the drive control and the proper joystick handle and the, the proper joystick, it was the other things that we could do with it, the three direction driving, the reassigning the directions. But we also have, remember we talked about, we have to give him access to power positioning. He has to be able to tilt, do his recline, all those other features to you know, overall protect himself from you know, you know, potential pressure injuries and whatnot. So he needed, and then he also needed to be able to change modes. If he was inside, he could go into slow mode. When he was outside, he could go a little bit faster. So we had to give him options to, change modes, options to turn the chair on and off. And we had to give him a toggle. So what we were able to do, we had this nice joystick built-in kind of tray that we could attach a, a switch to, but we didn't really have space to mount three different switches. So what we were able to do is program all three of those functions through that single switch. So he was able to give it a quick press and it would change modes. If he would press and hold it, it would turn the chair off. And if he double activated the switch, then it would toggle him between forward and reverse. So we were able to do all of those functions through that single switch. So I kind of just want you guys to kind of understand that importance of understanding, the, not only understanding the devices, but what you can do with them when, you, when you're using them and how you can adapt them. Because we could have very easily 
oh, this joystick's not going to work because he can't do this and this. But with programming, it was successful. And we could have easily just, oh, doesn't work. We're going to go down to switches. But this gave him a little bit, a lot more efficiency. And um, I'll show you a couple uh, quick videos of Brandon. It's, um, the cameraman is terrible. I'm sorry. Um, but, but you can see he's you know, driving with that. He's very efficient, makes turns very well. Um, here's just another one. I wanted to show kind of a quick video of him basically kind of pulling up to the therapy mat, which would kind of simulate pulling up next to his bed for pre preparation for a transfer. But he had very accurate control. So, and then you could see him activating his switch. So, um, so that's, so that's Brandon. Does anybody have any questions about the setup, the decision making process? Um, anything about Brand? Yeah, this was actually an inpatient. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that's a great question. So either, you know, the logical option is, is you have to sometimes have multiple sessions potentially for that. Uh, but what some manufacturers will do, um, and I can mainly speak about our product, is we actually have what's called a clinic mode built into our chair. And what you can have is essentially like one chair and you could have up to six different devices ready and programmed like they're not necessarily all mounted onto the chair, but they can all be kind of programmed and ready. That all you have to do is like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop on this joystick, and I'm gonna go into this, this mode, and we can trial it. So it does. There are some options out there where you could get a number of different trials if you have the obviously if you have the equipment available to you. Um, but you can quickly go from different devices. Um, and that sort of thing. And then, you know, programming, connecting the programmer is, is really quick and you can change things. Um, you can, ch like I said, you can change out the drive controls. Um, you know, sometimes what's going to slow you down maybe is, you know, maybe some different mounting options, but a lot of the different mounting options out there um, are pretty adjustable. So again, it, it's not necessarily, you know, obviously we had the luxury of, uh, you know, a longer stay you know, during inpatient, but it can be done from an outpatient standpoint. Uh, you have to coordinate it pretty well, but there are things like that, especially like if you only have like maybe one chair at your disposal, you can use that one chair in your outpatient clinic and have a bunch of different drive controls ready to, to go. So that is one option. But um, if you want to chat more about that, you know, just pop down and find me in the booth and we can, you know, if you have like specific examples or if you want to talk through some of that, we can definitely do that. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, obviously with latching, the most of the time when I've used latch is with pneumatic controls or sip and puff controls. So almost always do I latch with uh, pneumatic devices. There are times where I will latch other devices and you can latch joysticks. You just need, that person just needs to really understand, hey, I need to give it another command um, to stop. A good reaction time. I don't, I haven't done a ton of, latching with joysticks, but I have, and I've latched header A's. Um, and then Samantha is going to talk about another device that we did some latching with too. So I'm going to turn it over to her because I do not know how long I took, but. Um, um, yeah, so in my case study, we're going to talk about how we use latch with single switch scanning to drive power mobility. And um, the question about following it was in inpatient too. So the organization that I work with, we start is um, we have services across the continuum. So um, we started his chair in inpatient, but then I was able to follow him all the way to long-term care to continue kind of the whole case study. But even if that wasn't in the case, 
I think um, the relationship that I've built with like our manufacturers and our ATP to kind of keep in communication with them, even for my person serve that haven't been haven't stayed with us through the continuum to kind of keep in touch with them, like asking like, how's it going, reach out for questions, how can I help, you know, move this forward or change something for them, even if they're not still with me. It's kind of what's been helpful, I think, to follow them, even if they're not a part of On With Life anymore. Okay, so this is Lynn. Um, at the time of his chair, he was 20 years old, um, with not a lot of other medical history. Um, he suffered a traumatic brain injury from a gunshot wound um, with anoxia. Um, upon admission to On With Life, um, he presented almost instantly, even in the acute care hospital, with severe spasticity. Um, he has flexion contractures on the right and extension on the left. Um, he was dependent for all of his cares. Um, he couldn't walk. Um, he was essentially kind of presented like locked in. The only thing he could do was eye blinks and open and close his mouth with his jaw. Um, and he used that, he wasn't very accurate with using eye blinks to try to communicate, like how, how we maybe sometimes would try that for locked in. He was, however, very accurate with using his mouth open and closed for yes, no. So for him, mouth open is yes, mouth closed is no. And then he used this quadrant alphabet board um, for communication. Um, his initial mobility base was like Wade mentioned too, he was using a manual tilt and space wheelchair for dependent mobility and positioning. Um, because of his significant impairments, gate devices and manual wheelchairs were eliminated from consideration. After seeing how he was doing with the alphabet quadrant board, talking with us and communicating, we felt really strongly like, okay, we have to do what we can to get get you mobility, get you independent, um, move from one place to the other. Um, and so what, what I do is I'm like, this is what I want. This is what I want the chair to be able to do. And then I call my people and help me set it up. Um, so we were able to get a demo chair available and try some seating options. So um, like we mentioned the hierarchy of, of driving everything. He was not able to use a standard joystick. He didn't have active movement anywhere else. He didn't even have like a little index finger or a little thumb, no, like a toe. He had no other active movement other than opening and closing his jaw, even moving his head. Like he didn't really have head movement back and forth. Um, like I even considered like, can you lift an eyebrow? He was, that tone and spasticity really set in everywhere on him except for that jaw. Um, and it mentioned about his upper extremity contractures. His legs were also contracted in extension um, with toes pointed as well. Um, because of those severe deficits, we weren't able, even able to move the joystick somewhere else. Um, considered, you know, trying to put it up on the chin, like his didn't even have like the chin jaw movement to be able to use a chin control. He really was only able to, um, um, this is the same thing. He wasn't really able to do anything. So we had to move on to switch. Head array, like I mentioned, he wasn't able to use a head array because he didn't have active movement in the head or consistent movement to control any of those switches. He wasn't able to use a sip and puff. We thought maybe this would be an option for him, but for some reason, he just could not get the hang of it. He was even trialing using a sip and puff call light in his room while he was inpatient, but he could never get the hang of that either. He used like a blue tent call light underneath his chin to activate to call for the nurse. Um, so we did try this, but he just was not able to get the hang of it. And he got really nervous while driving. If he wasn't, if he felt out of control, he got really nervous and, and um, it was a big safety concern for him. So we really had to make sure that he felt comfortable as well. So we moved on. We couldn't, we talked about trying two different switch options, but we really had to rule those out because he only had jaw open and close or it, what, he couldn't even move his jaw over just a little bit to activate a second one. He really could only hit one right below his chin. So we landed on the one, one switch input with single switch scanning. 
Um, as Wade mentioned too, keeping in contact with our speech therapist, he was using that low tech letter quadrant board for communication, but they were trialing using a switch under his chin for activating an iPad. Um, so we were like, well, why can't you drive your chair that way too? Um, so we initially mounted, you can kind of see that gray bar that comes out underneath there. We put a switch there. Um, and then you can see the screen um, of what the, the screen looks like in all the different arrows. The, oh, it is scanning. I didn't realize that. <laughs> so that's what it did while he was driving. Um, and so he would have to, when the arrow highlighted yellow, he would hit his switch to go that direction. And we did latch forward. We tried initially, he was not driving with latch, um, but his jaw got really fatigued holding it open. And he also just didn't like driving with his mouth open going down the, the hallway. So we did end up putting um, forward on latch and then what we needed all the things in place to be able to stop and then change directions. So this is his demo chair and this was him just practicing it out in an outdoor area that we have. Um, his neck was also kind of tight and fixed over to the right side there, um, which was a barrier he kind of always had to have, I called it a mobility partner with him to make sure he was safe. We kind of watched to remember which video this was. So he started veering off to the sidewalk there and stopped the chair. Um, and then I think he's waiting for it to scan back around so he can reverse and get himself out of there, I think. Maybe not. I think this is, he's showing us how he's, um, Got a pressure relief. So he waits for it. Um, you can, oh, he almost got it. I can't remember if it had to access like a two step kind of. Oh, it circled to the mode. Yeah. The barrier to this, as you're seeing, is that it took a long time. Um, he was reliant on it to scan to do anything. Um, and I'll, I think in another video, the next one I'll show you, it ended up being a barrier too. And once he was in, got his custom chair and in a facility, because to make a turn to go through a door or to stop if somebody stopped up in front of him, he could emergency stop, but he couldn't make those quick turns because he was so reliant on the screen circling through whether he needed to get left or right. It's mounted on a, a mount that was like attached to the back of his chair and it was underneath the chin. It was swing away. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'll try to get through because I know we're almost out of time, but these are the programming needs. And again, I, as a, as a therapist, this was a lot of this was new to me, and I relied heavily on Wade to help me. I kind of again, I told him like, "This is like, can it, can it, can this arrow scan faster? Can it go slower in this mode? Can we change the directions that they're going?" So when the person, so if he actually decided what order he wanted the arrows to scan in to, on the most likely directions that he was going to need to go while driving the chair in a facility, we adjusted the scan speed so that it would go quickly through those options. So if he did need to turn left or right, he could do that timely, um, but not too fast that he would miss it, kind of finding that balance. We added the two-step scanning so um, he could get into the modes and different controls there. The e-stop access so he could do a quick emergency stop. And he also had Bluetooth access to his iPad that he used the same scanning system for. So this is his actual custom chair. And while it's talking, I'll just say that um, this chair was actually denied by insurance initially because it wasn't custom. <laughs> and so we had to appeal it and then it got denied again and we had to take it to ALJ and then we finally got it approved. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you can kind of see as he's going through the doorway, he's having to, he needs to turn right. Um, but he needed to wait for the arrow to get that way so he could make that turn. He was so good. I was so impressed with how well he drove this chair. In general, he didn't have a lot of, you know, quote unquote, cognitive dis um, 
difficulties. Um, so that really worked in his favor here. He did sometimes have stuff with attention, but in eye gaze was difficult for him because his eyes would get tired. Yeah. Oh. Once we kind of got him that that trial, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily it's it's a it's a tricky setup, but I mean, it does take some time and for him to practice, and it takes more than just the time that he has in therapy as well. So we, you know, we, it's important to kind of teach, you know, in an inpatient. Yeah, yeah. wouldn't you say at least yeah, a couple? Yeah, I would months. say yeah, lots of practice time. This that video was just showing how he uses the the scanning to scan through the iPad, and he's sending a message there. So, and I mentioned earlier, he got a baclofen pump and um, we did see some kind of effects of relaxing of his muscles that kind of translated up higher for him. Um, and he had some increased oral motor and jaw movement, which opened up his, the doors for him for other mobility. So now he drives with a mini proportional joystick off of the, um, a chest harness and it, I mean, works fabulous for him. He does so well much more independent, more in control. Um, and uh, we were able to, we took it to insurance and we're able to get that approved for him as well. So here's him driving. And I think that we're almost out of time. So hopefully, does anybody have any questions before? Most manufacturers have the uh, single switch scanning just built into their expandable electronics. Uh, that was our our QLogic three. Yep. I don't know if I mentioned that that I don't know if I said he's driving with his tongue. So that was yeah. Yeah. Um, his was Medicaid. Yeah. Just from an efficiency standpoint, did you try an eye gaze? Yeah. Did he? Did he? Uh, well, I gave well, I we trialed eye gaze og com with him. We did not trial it for driving. Yeah, he um, ended up not liking the eye gaze. He likes personal interaction. So he kind of forces us to bring the low tech communication board to him to communicate with him. So he's he's kind of just stuck with it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the e-stop, I can't remember off the top of my head if it, I think it was a quick. No, it was an extended it's an extended press. So he gets a quick press can start it. And then it's, and you can set the timing of that e-stop. So once he would hold it for, you know, a second or whatever you wanted to set that to, that's how he would stop it. So if it, is, if it was on like the right arrow or something like that, and he did that extended press, it would turn him to the right, right? So how would it e-stop? Yeah, um, it was wondering. Yeah, it was like a sorry. It was um to ease stop. It was just like a really specific timing amount that I can't can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I have to maybe I could go back and look for you too. I almost maybe want to say that can't be right. I was going to say maybe you could only e stop if he was going forward, but yeah, I don't think. I, yeah. 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 It and granted, one of those things with latch driving, it's 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 tricky. So I mean. You know, you have to wait for that arrow to scan the correct direction to to turn. So obviously, it was really great that we were able to progress him to the the chin drive. So um, I know we're right up on the a little bit over. So I'm gonna let her give a code. If anybody uh, would like copies of the handout, uh, just go ahead and scan with your uh, phone camera the QR code and just put in the information, and I'm happy to send you guys out the. Uh, copies of the presentation in a PDF form. Um, and otherwise, I'll let her give you the code and go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation.